and I want to welcome again everybody is here today. I love that verse that Daniela shared. Again, it was Ephesians chapter 2 and 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, here's the thing. No more strangers and foreigners. There's no more visitors and guests. God doesn't have visitors and guests in his house. He has children in his house. Amen. And so we all have the right to be here. Uh, and he invited all of us to be here to worship him. So as we begin here, let's bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, tell us the story of Jesus. Write on our hearts every word. Tell us the story most precious, sweetest we've, that ever was heard. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to come with me, if you will, to a, a dinner party that was held nearly 2,000 years ago. It was the Passover season, and Jesus and the Twelve are in the little town of Bethany, about a mile and a half east of Jerusalem. They've just observed the Sabbath day with their good friends, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. But now the sun is set. It's the evening of the first day of the week. And they are invited to the home of Simon of Bethany. So let's pick up the story here in John chapter 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, there they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Simon's home was large enough to accommodate many guests, and as it turned out, Jesus was the guest of honor, and sitting next to him, on one side was Simon, the host. On the other side of Jesus sat the good friend of, of Jesus, Lazarus. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, made all the dinner preparations, and, and Mary was nearby listening to everything Jesus had to say. So it was Simon the leper's idea to invite Jesus to be the guest of honor at this dinner. We're not told how or where or when he had been healed of his leprosy, but it's, it's clear that Simon needed a miracle that only God could perform. See, leprosy was considered to be the stroke of God. It was actually a bacterial infection. Uh, it would gain access in a human body through the mucous um, areas of the eyes or the nose or the mouth. And it would first show up as, as a skin rash, maybe whitish blotches on the skin. Uh, but then this bacteria would progress. It would start attacking the nerves under the skin, especially around the hands and the feet. It would uh, lead to a loss of physical sensation. And so it wasn't uncommon for lepers to, to get injured, not knowing that they were hurt. And there would be scarring and infection. And this would lead to disfiguring of their extremities and, and even losses of, of digits. Um, as the disease continued to progress, it would enter what was called a tuberculoid phase, 
where a person would grow a, a thick nodular skin and would be more disfiguring. But because of it being a, a contagious disease, a leper was required to cry out, unclean, unclean, if anybody ventured to get too close to, to where they were. Um, so that was their version of social distancing. But a leper, so a leper was banished from his home, banished from his family, banished from his community, banished from society. It was, it was worse than life. It was a living death. To make matters worse, leprosy was the ultimate humiliation for Simon. Because you see, Simon the leper was Simon the Pharisee, a strict keeper of the law. And, and uh, so Simon found himself being banished from family, from home, from community, from church, from society itself. And that was the ultimate humiliation for, for a keeper of the law. Wouldn't you agree? But lepers had only one hope in the time of Jesus. And any and every leper that Jesus encountered, he didn't hesitate. He acted very decisively. He healed them immediately. He restored their flesh. He restored their humanity, their individual uh, individuality. He restored their position in the family, in the home, in society. Listen to these words that are found on page 266 of one of my favorite books. It's called The Desire of Ages. In some instances of healing, Jesus did not at once grant the blessing sought. But in the case of leprosy, no sooner was the appeal made than it was granted. Now she switches gears, the author does. When we pray for earthly blessings, the answer to our prayer may be delayed, or God may give us something other than we ask, but not so when we ask for deliverance from what? Sin. From sin. It is his will to cleanse us from sin, to make us his children, and to enable us to live a holy life. That power comes from Jesus. Amen? So please notice the connection that was made here between leprosy and sin. Leprosy is also a metaphor for what sin is. Sin gains access to us through our, our physical senses, the things that we see and watch, the things that we listen to, the things that we eat and drink, the places that our feet take us, the things that our hands do. Sin has a way of making us insensitive to the whisperings of the spirit. It has a way of disfiguring our character. And just like leprosy, our only remedy for sin is Jesus. So try to imagine the sense of gratitude that Simon would have for Jesus. He was restored to health. He was restored to family, to community, to society, even to his standing in religious life. So yeah, let's, let's celebrate. Now on the other side of Jesus sat Lazarus, a close friend. Out, outside of the 12, Lazarus, his sister Martha, his other sister Mary, 
They were perhaps the closest friends that Jesus ever had on this earth. Whenever he was in or near Jerusalem, he had a welcome and inviting place to stay. It was at their home that Jesus could just be himself. That was so rare for him. For him. It was their home that Jesus genuinely felt loved and accepted and understood. Oh, friends, would it that you and I could have that kind of home where Jesus and his angels would love to come and visit, that they would feel welcome um, and comfortable, that they would feel loved and accepted and understood. So now Lazarus has a story to tell as well. It begins in John chapter 11. Now, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And skipping down to verse 3, that when he was sick, therefore his sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. It wasn't very long, we don't know how long, but fairly recently that Lazarus had been afflicted with a severe infection. His, his body was racked with high fever and, and intense pain. And everything that they did humanly to try to relieve his suffering was to no avail. Nothing was working. And Jesus, at this point in time, is a good two days away over in an area that's called Idumea. Um, so the sisters sent word to Jesus about the, the, um, the plight of their brother. In, uh, in verses 5 and 6, we read that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he, had therefore, when he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now that begs a question, doesn't it? Why did Jesus linger and not go immediately to help his friend? Is that what you or I would do? Well, let's read on. Skipping back to verse 4, Jesus had, was told his disciples that this sickness isn't unto death, but it's for the glory of God, and that the Son of Man might be glorified thereby. So he waited those two days. And then in verse 7, he says to his disciples, well, let's go now to Judea. So two days away, after two days of lingering, it's now four days. And verse 17 says that when Jesus did finally show up, that Lazarus had laid in the grave for four days already. That's significant because the Jewish belief at that time was that when a person died, they know that their breath, their, their ruach, their spirit, would leave the body, but they felt that that spirit would, would struggle, would contend to try to come back to the body to restore life to a soul. But when it reached the point that a body started to decompose, it's like all hope is gone. It, it, it's over. So Lazarus was, was dead. There wasn't any doubt. So Jesus is just outside Bethany, verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and, and met him. Mary didn't hear that, so she just stayed in the house. And then listen to the tears in the voice of Martha. 
She says, Lord, if if you'd been here, my brother had not died. But I know even now, whatsoever you ask of God, he'll do it for you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha, now Martha was the hostess type, right? Her house and furnishings were impeccable. They were always cleaned and dusted in their proper place. When she set a table, those dishes and those utensils were exactly where they needed to be. And when she made a meal, oh my goodness, good meal. But she also took time to listen to what uh, Jesus was teaching the people. And so she says here, I know that he shall rise again. When? In the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says to her, what are to me maybe the seven most important words that Jesus ever spoke that's recorded in scripture. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Moving on, verse 32. Now Mary heard that Jesus was was there. And she comes out to where Jesus was and saw him, fell down at his feet, and she echoes the words of her sister Martha. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had not died. So Jesus asked, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. So Jesus went and looked. And then that one verse of scripture that youngsters just love to recite when they're asked to recite something, Jesus wept. Don't miss the humanity of Jesus here. He wept for Lazarus. He leapt, He wept for his sisters. He wept for all those professional mourners that, that showed up to make a cacophony of wailing and, and grieving. Jesus wept for his friend, but I think he also wept for the unbelief of the people that were gathered there, the ones that didn't believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And maybe, just maybe, Jesus weeps for us today, for our unbelief, yours and mine. So, verse 41, They took away the stone from the place where where they'd laid Lazarus. And Jesus lifts up his eyes to heaven, to his father. He says, I thank you, Father, that you have heard me. There's already been conversation taking place between them. And I knew you hear me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it said what? I am the resurrection and the life, that they may believe that you have sent me. There were still questions in the the minds of certain people. Is Jesus who he said he is? And did God really send him? So verse 43, and when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot in grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus says to him, let him loose. Cut the man's loose. <laughs> 
You know, Jesus had to be very specific in his command to call only one person from the tomb. If he left out the name of Lazarus, how many people would have come out of the grave? But his command pierced the ears and the mind of Lazarus. And his heart started beating again. And his lungs started breathing again. And his flesh started to reverse the decomposing that had already taken place. And so Lazarus left the tomb alive. The voice that woke up Lazarus, it's the same voice that commanded billions of galaxies to come into being, everything we see and know of creation. His is the voice that has power over the wind and, and the waves. He demonstrated that. He has power over the demons and devils. He demonstrated that. He has power over disease. He healed all manner of disease, up to and even including leprosy. And now he's demonstrated he has power over death itself. Jesus left no doubt as to who he is. He is God manifest in the flesh. And he is the resurrection and the life. Now, as we know, Mary was also present at that dinner party. She's the younger sister of Lazarus and Martha. So what's her story? Um, earlier in Christ's ministry, we have the story of their first encounter. Uh, let's look at it in John chapter 8, beginning at verse 2. And early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and was teaching them. All of a sudden, the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery, and uh, John is so gracious in his choice of words here. And when they set her in the midst, it's like they rudely um, bowled their way to in front of Jesus and, and essentially threw her down at, at his feet. And they say to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that people like this should be stoned. But what do you say? They said this, tempting him, trying to back Jesus into a corner, weren't they? That they might have something to accuse him of. But Jesus just stooped down with his finger, began writing on the ground as though he didn't even hear them. These religious leaders were confronting Jesus with a dilemma, weren't they? You know what a dilemma is. It's one of two choices that you can make, and neither one of them are good ones. That's what they tried to get Jesus uh, backed into. So they're thinking, all right, let's get him to condemn her, and we'll go to the Roman authority and say, well, we, we didn't give him authority to do this, and you haven't either. You need to arrest this guy. Or it'd be the other way. He lets her go. And then, then they accuse him of just throwing the law of Moses into the trash. Making, making the, the, the law void. So, Jesus just ignores them. Verse 7, So when they asked him again, they 
kept insisting, what are you going to do? He finally, he lifted himself up, said to them, he that's without sin among you, you throw the first stone. And then he stooped down, continued writing on the ground. Did they give Jesus no way of escape? Are there times that they give us no way of escape? When we don't see a way, God has a way. So Jesus was discreetly showing her accusers that he knew none of them were without sin. So down to verse 10. Jesus lifted himself up. He got up again and saw no one but the woman. So he says to her, Woman, what happened to your accusers? Where'd they go? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No, man. No, no man, Lord. And then Jesus spoke spoke these liberating words to Mary. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go, but sin no more. Again, from the book called Desire of Ages, on page 25, we have these sublime words. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we have no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his, and it's with his stripes that we are healed. How is it that Jesus could say he didn't condemn Mary? Could he abolish the law and the condemnation that results from its violation? You know, a lesser God might think to change times and laws, but no. Jesus upheld a law that cannot be changed without changing the whole fabric of reality and creation. Jesus, rather, would choose to satisfy the claims of the law by taking Mary's condemnation upon himself. Not just Mary's, yours and mine as well. Only God could do that. Only God in his essence is love. So Mary became a Jesus person. We read in Luke chapter 8 that it came to pass afterward that he, Jesus, went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. And then Dr. Luke uh, specifically mentions Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Mary was damaged goods. All the men that she ever knew were takers. They took away her innocence. They took away her purity. They took away her youth. They took away her dignity. They took away every sense of self-worth that she had. Mary had been reduced to just an object of lust, someone for men's gratification. And the demons took up residence. But then 
Jesus showed up. He restored everything to Mary. Her, her dignity, her self-worth, her youth, her purity, her innocence, all of it restored to Mary. But it didn't happen in an instant. It didn't happen overnight. Because when you're enslaved by evil spirits, Jesus has to set you free. And he set Mary free. And he set her free again. And again. And again. Seven times in all, the scriptures tell us, Jesus had to peel away the iniquities one by one. The iniquities, those places where the demons love to dwell. And like layers of an onion, he finally got to the very core of her being. And Mary finally, for the first time in her life, could perceive that here is a man who's a giver, not a taker. That's what love feels like, real love. It is agape love. It's the love of God. So she's at the dinner. And after being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as Jesus sat to eat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. She broke the box and poured it on his head. It was for the past six months that Jesus was telling the disciples he was going to Jerusalem where he'd be arrested and crucified, but would rise again the third day. It went right over their heads. They were so fixated on the son of David assuming the throne in Jerusalem and overthrowing the Romans. His words fell on deaf ears, but not so with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And Mary especially took to heart what Jesus had foretold. And so for all that he had done for her, Mary was determined that Jesus would have a dignified burial. So now, come with me. Let's go shopping with Mary in our, in our sanctified imagination. She didn't go to Walmart. No way. She didn't go to Target, uh-uh. She didn't even go to Dillard's. She went to the finest private label perfumer in the town. So as she walks through the door, the proprietor kind of sizes her up and directs her toward his entry level fragrances. Mary says, sir, this won't do. What else do you have? So then he shows her some of his more pricey offerings. No, this isn't going to work either. Tell me, what, what's the best that you have to offer? So he stepped into the back room for a moment. And he comes out with a beautiful flask of translucent limestone. Isn't that alabaster? She asks. Why, yes it is. It contains the oil of spikenard. Very rare, very rare. It comes from the roots of the valerian pan, plant and is found only in India, and in India only above 11,000 feet. Now once you, the flask is opened, it must be used all at once or else it will go bad. And the proprietor said proudly, he said, I'm, I'm saving this for royalty. And Mary said, sir, I'm buying this for royalty. How much? The man tells her, 300 denarii, a big sum of money in those days, thinking that 
she won't have that kind of money. <laughs> I'll take it, she says, as she puts the money in his hand. So Mary had bought this ointment. She planned to use it to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. But then the night of this dinner, as she's getting ready, a still small voice says to her, Mary, take it tonight. And then once the guests were settled in and there's conversation and all kinds of uh, things going on, that same still small voice whispers, open it now, Mary. And so she did. John chapter 12 and verse 3, then took Mary, a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the aroma, with the fragrance. Forgive the King James writers, odor. Odor doesn't sound very pleasant. This was a most pleasant fragrance. Well, when the disciples saw that, they didn't see it first, they smelled it first. But then they saw what was happening, they cry out in indignation, why, why did we waste this? This ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Overcome with emotion, Mary wasn't prepared for this to happen. All the conversation just stopped as the fragrance of royalty overwhelmed the dining room of Simon's house. All eyes turned to where Jesus is sitting and where Mary is cowering. She's seen this look of disdain before. And Jesus says, leave her alone. Why are you troubling her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. She's done what she could, and she's come beforehand to prepare my body for burying. Then Jesus says something remarkably profound. Don't miss it. In verse 9 of Mark 14, Verily I say to you, whenever... This gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world. This also that she has done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Why did Jesus say that? Could it be that Jesus is the costliest gift that God in heaven could give to a hopeless and dying humanity? Could it be that his fragile, delicate humanity like this alabaster flask would be broken only once? Could it be that his shed blood relieved this fragrance of the grace of God that would fill the whole earth, that it would be available to anyone and to everyone who would just believe in him? Not everyone that evening believed yet. And so Jesus had some unfinished business to attend to. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he says to himself, this man, Jesus, if he was a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him, for she is a sinner. So Jesus answers, he says, Simon, I have a story to tell you. Simon says, go ahead. There was a certain creditor that had two debtors. One of them owned, owed him 500 pence and the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. So tell me, Simon, which of them loved him more? Simon 
thought about that not very long. He said, well, I suppose it's the one that he forgave the most. Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. So in a very private moment between Jesus and Simon, in a very public setting, the light of truth went on in Simon's mind. Jesus had already healed him of his leprosy, but now Jesus was healing Simon, the Pharisee, the keeper of the law. How was it that Simon knew so much about Mary? And how was it that Jesus knew so much about what Simon knew? It wouldn't be much of a stretch to infer that Simon was a close relative of Lazarus and Martha and Mary. Nor would it be much of a stretch to infer that Simon, who knew what kind of a woman Mary was, had a part in her downward spiral in life. So for which of the two had the greater debt in the parable of Jesus? It would appear that Mary had the greater debt because she loved Jesus more. But however sinful the life of Mary was, far more sinful was the life of Simon, the Pharisee, the keeper of the law. We're told that Simon became that night and remained for the rest of his life a Jesus person. So Jesus has to make sure that Mary's okay. So he says to her, your sins are forgiven. And then the end of the, in verse 50, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The next morning, Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey in the manner of kings with the crowd waving palm branches, Hosanna to the son of David. Within five days, many of that crowd would be yelling, crucify him, crucify him. He was arrested and crucified. Jesus lifted up as the world's redeemer, God suspended between heaven and earth, not held by nails to a rugged cross, held by an infinite love for you and me. So my question to you this morning, well, it's this afternoon now, forgive me. What do you need? Jesus has command over the wind and the waves, command over the slavery of sinfulness, command over the powers of darkness, command over death. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All power, all authority in heaven and on earth resides in the person of Jesus. So what do you need? You and I can see with our own eyes the growing disregard for life and for law in our world today. We can see that light is being called darkness and darkness is being called light. We can see that this present world we live in is wearing out like an old garment it's weighed down by the curse that we talked about in Sabbath school this morning. 
we can see that rapid changes are taking place in our world right now, telling us that the end is soon to come. So I ask you once more, what do you need? What do I need? What will we need going forward? Well, above all, we need to trust. We need to trust that God will sustain us in the midst of our present circumstance. We need to trust that God will never lose his grip on us. We need to trust his word, this book, everything it says. We need to trust that he will supply all our need according to his riches in glory, as this book says. We need to trust that anywhere with Jesus, we can safely go. Let's pray. May the song we just sang be the song of our heart. May we walk with you, have a love relationship with you, have a level of trust that will guide us through the days that lay ahead for us. You have promised to be with us to the end of the age, to the end of the world. We, we believe you, Lord. We love you and we bow before you. Please be with us now and as we go over to the fellowship hall and, and enjoy a meal, I pray that you will bless the food that is prepared and I pray that you will bless the hands that have prepared it. And uh, may we have joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.